so Nils is a media, media engineer, architect, and researcher. Uh, is currently pursuing a PhD at the University of Leuven uh, that investigates social architectural qualities of media architecture. And in this talk, uh, it will discuss the challenges of involving citizens in the design of media interventions in the urban environment. So, Niels? That's completely yeah. correct. <laughs> yeah, because this is your description. Yeah, so. so it should have been correct, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you to IML for inviting me over, um, and also thank you for, uh, for attending my talk or our talks. Um, I'm quite happy to see a lot of familiar faces, urban IXD faces, uh, so I feel quite comfortable here. Uh, but at the same time, I'm quite comfortable that KU Leuven is very well represented. I have some master's students, or one master's student. I have a colleague here. Uh, anyone else who is linked with KU Leuven? No? Okay, well, at least three people then. Um, so, um, as Yannick already introduced, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Leuven, which is practically around the corner, uh, but in Belgium everything is around the corner. Um, and we are housed in this pretty nice uh, old castle. And um, even though this castle looks quite classic, uh, our research group called Research X Design, so research through design, research by design, research with design, et cetera, et cetera, uh, our research group focuses on the use, the optimization, and also the evaluation of uh, all kinds of technology in, uh, in public space, in urban space. Uh, the group is led by Andrew van der Moede, also known as uh, Infostatics. And uh, some of our most recent studies, they involve uh, studies on how to bring data back into the urban environment, um, aiming for some sort of comparative feedback uh, between residents. Uh, for example, in this project, the uh, neighborhood scoreboards project, uh, which is still ongoing and which is currently evolving from these very uh, traditional or classic chalkboards to more digital screens. Uh, there the ambition was to visualize energy usage on a day-to-day -day and on a house-to-house -house basis and as such uh, trigger some sort of competition between the, between the residents and have a positive impact, of course, on, uh, on energy usage. Similarly, we recently have also made some more quantifiable characteristics of urban streets, of typical urban streets, uh, visible by attaching or by adding an additional layer to uh, street signs themselves. So you can see the, the blue uh, sign underneath the already existing blue uh, street sign. And uh, there our study revealed that making these otherwise unknown data visible and making these otherwise unknown data um, sort of tangible in the street, in the city, uh, may have a positive impact on how people interact with each other, but especially provide additional insights in concerns that may live in a city. For example, here, um, it, it gives you some information about who is living in that street uh, in Leuven, and Leuven is known to be a, a student city or a university city. And there appear to be quite some tension between the permanent residents, between the students, you know how student life goes, right? Uh, so there were some tensions, and here we immediately visualized, like, hey, guys, this is the exact percentage of, of students living there. Uh, there were other signs uh, indicating the exact percentage of immigrants living in a certain street, and as such, really pointing people to the, the, the true facts and, and making discussions, of course, possible, but also providing some sort of common ground and, and uh, real data to ground these discussions in. Um, and a more recent project that the artist slash researcher is here as well, so please talk to him for more information, um, is uh, studies on the role of ludic interfaces in the urban environment. So I, I hope my summary is correct, Thomas. Correct me if I'm wrong or stand up or throw anything at me. Um, so uh, the role of ludic interfaces in the urban environment as a way of motivating social interaction and play in the city. Is that correct, Thomas? Thanks. So uh, in that respect, so a colleague of mine recently evaluated uh, an, urban, uh, an urban game in and around Ghent, uh, which is also a Belgian city or Flemish city, that kind of uh, motivated two distinct neighborhoods or residents in two distinct neighborhoods to compete against each other, but where especially the group effort was uh, rewarded rather than the individual effort. That's still correct, Thomas? Yeah, OK, <laughs> more or less. Um, so after that short introduction, my own research, uh, Yannick already told about it, it's, it's on, on media architecture. I think, well, a very popular or a widely embraced kind of 
urban media nowadays. Um, and I indeed investigate the social and also the architectural qualities of media architecture. Uh, for those unaware or for those not really related to the phenomenon, it's most commonly described as the field that, uh, well, studies or that describes the integration of various kinds of display media in urban space, so attached to buildings, uh, positioned on a public square, uh, things like that. It's, it's a very broad spectrum, so it covers media facades, very abstract artistic media facades, but between brackets, unfortunately, also electronic public screens, urban screens, which are not necessarily very aesthetic or very well integrated in, in urban environments. Um, I don't want to be too academic in this talk. Uh, I know, or I, I realize that there are not that many academics here, so I will approach it from a bit of a, uh, well, open point of view. Um, but I will especially describe how in my research or in, my, in the studies that I've conducted till now, how a close involvement of citizens has really provided me with some additional insights, which has really shown me what the challenges and what the true potential of media architecture um, is in terms of what people want to see on media architecture or on a public screen, or even how people can be involved in the design process of these, uh, of these things. Because most commonly they are imposed in a sort of top-down manner, like a company says, hey, we want this very expensive and very bright media facade uh, to have some sort of impact on the urban environment. And by doing that, we will show off our corporate wealth, of course. Uh, but also you have communities saying we want this electronic display because we want to communicate fast uh, to, our, to our citizens. But it is still relatively unexplored what the requirements or what the desires of citizens themselves are. What do they want to see? Uh, how do they want the media architecture to be? Does it really have to be that large? Can it, can't it be downscaled to the size of a house, to the size of a street, etc., etc.? Um, the media architecture, how I see it, is, is definitely not a new phenomenon. It's uh, in some way, but I know that there are media theorists here that m may probably uh, tell more and more in detail about it than I can, uh, but my experience is that it, it, it's actually rooted in, in, uh, in history, as buildings have always served more purposes than just protect you from the elements, than just provide some sort of structural support. Uh, but it has, has always been a way to show what is inside the building or to show what the cultural um, richness is in a specific area or in a specific era. Uh, think of facades in the, in the Gothic period that tell a cultural story through their, well, very extensive ornamentation. Think of, and perhaps that's the most obvious analog form of media architecture, think of the very mythical, religious, but also uh, historical stories that are told on these uh, very detailed stained glass panels in many Western European churches. Um, and think of yeah, more contemporary facades that want to show off um, ingenuity and, and material expertise, structural expertise, tectonic expertise as a sort of um, analog, analog media architecture. And as such, media architecture is in fact a continuation of this historical, uh, of this historical background um, in the sense that it adds an additional layer, uh, physical and aesthetic layer, to buildings in order to, uh, like I said, to show off some sort of corporate wealth, uh, to attempt to augment the, the cityscape with an aesthetic layer, uh, perhaps even an interactive kind of uh, visual layer, or be deployed for simple reasons of uh, improved public communication or, well, like this example, very uh, rough, I would say, advertising, uh, advertising purposes. Um, commonly they are, well, appreciated for their architectural and for their aesthetic qualities um, as a platform for communicating information, as a platform for interaction, as a platform for socialization, as a platform for play. Um, and this is, a, well, one of the first pages that I get when I uh, do a Google search, a Google image, image search on, uh, on media architecture. But one thing that has always uh, struck me is where are the people in all these very nice pictures? Uh, I mean, there is this one rendering with six or seven people. Um, but isn't that what cities are about, about people that really make the city uh, make the city atmosphere and make it, make it uh, well, comfortable. So 
that has actually motivated me to also investigate the bottom-up approach. Uh, and as, as you will also see in this, uh, this part, there are quite some issues with media architecture. There are a few, but I've selected a few that are relevant for, for this symposium. Um, mostly media architecture is still considered uh, a gimmick, a sort of ornament that you can easily attach to a building and hopefully it will uh, have a long lasting life. Uh, think of Dexia Tower, uh, which is only a few kilometers or not even a few kilometers away from here. Um, and it has long time been an international protagonist in the media architecture scene. I think it was even one of the first uh, media facades on the scale of a complete building, almost a skyscraper. Um, and for long, no other projects existed. But then all of a sudden, in, I think, 2008, there was this economic crisis, um, and Dexia Tower, Dexia was the name of a bank that owned the building that also had its offices in the building. And the bank kind of failed. I don't know if it really failed, but at least there were quite some financial issues with the bank. Um, so what did I decide? Well, let's simply pull the plug and let's turn off our media facade. Um, which is, of course, you can imagine that it's a logical decision because there was this um, changing view towards the bank or a bank or banks in general uh, as institutions that possess a lot of money but do not know how to spend the money or to invest the money. Um, and still they were using all this money on um, the energy costs that were used or that were necessary for illuminating the facade. So all of a sudden they pulled the plug. But of course, well, pulling the plug, it's, it's an action that doesn't really exist in architecture. Uh, you don't really close windows all of a sudden in a building. Uh, you don't really uh, tear down that wall just for the purpose of this symposium, for example. Um, all these actions, they have to be rooted in some sort of vision, into some sort of long-lasting vision, and you have to evaluate the impact or the possible negative impact that it has on your building. And especially in the case of Dexia Tower, uh, it's a huge building. Uh, it was visible from afar. Um, and such an action, simply pulling the plug, of course, has a very social effect. Uh, in fact, the, the local people from around the tower, which is Brussels North, came to congratulate the architects or the interaction designers that made quite some uh, interactive installations and thank them for giving something back to the neighborhood, um, which is otherwise a neighborhood that is a bit, well, not necessarily neglected, but it's a business district. Uh, there are few people really interested in, in doing relevant urban interventions there, but they came to congratulate them. And then all of a sudden, they lost their um, platform for play, their platform for communication even. Um, also spatially, of course, switching this thing off, it long served as a sort of beacon for tourists, for residents to navigate through the city at night, and then all of a sudden this beacon was gone, uh, which is a pity, of course. Um, in addition to that, uh, and this is like a typical public display, uh, so also a form of media architecture. In addition to that, several uh, types of media architecture, especially public displays, have been vandalized in the past and are still being vandalized nowadays. Um, and they were clearly motivated by uh, a very yeah, distinct mismatch between the content that was shown and then the social and the demographic structure of the environment around such a screen. Uh, to illustrate this, on this screen in the beginning they showed uh, announcements for running competitions in a very upscale district in Brussels while it is shown in a neighborhood that is a bit, well, sensitive in a way, uh, and as such they responded by, well, damaging the screen, uh, I think it was even uh, put on fire once, um, and I think the last act of vandalism was a few months or a year ago. So it's still ongoing, and apparently there is not a clear solution to that. So what is actually, uh, what is to be done? What can we show, what can we not show on such a screen? How can we evaluate this context and how can we learn from this context to show the content that's, uh, that's appropriate? Um, and then our last case or last issue, uh, I don't know if it's very clear, but this is a screen. So on top of here there is a very uh, classic, uh, how do you call it, a LED matrix, a new sticker or something like that. Uh, which is hardly, you can hardly call it a screen, but anyway, they bought it and they, they set it there. Um, 
And what you see here is some sort of bottom-up initiative that even though it is owned by the city council and it's actually supposed to be like, well, addressing everyone, right? It's supposed to be open. Everyone should be able to read the messages, even though they're text only, but still they're meant to address everyone. And still citizens don't have any opportunity to contribute to, to what is actually shown. And, and what you see here is that people start to uh, stick their own messages onto that display, or at least onto the, the structural support of this display, about some dogs that are missing, about a cat that is missing. Um, and I think that actually indicates that there is a, a gap that we should provide people with some opportunity to freely uh, share their own content. And then, of course, there can still be a committee that decides about the appropriateness of, of such a content proposal. But still, I think this is a very nice example of how the the huge cost for such a screen and the huge cost for such an ugly planter underneath the screen. I don't know who sells these kinds of screens to communities, but I find it very funny that most of these screens are actually surrounded by, by a planter, uh, as if that makes everything better. Uh, but anyway, that's another discussion. Um, so yeah, there is still a gap in opening up this platform as a sort of yeah, public communication uh, medium. Um, and in fact, I've uh, tried to look at some other issues or some other alternatives or some other approaches in urban planning. And I think there are quite some similar occurrences, some more bottom-up movements that start to emerge in, you know, in international cities where people start to take matters into own hands um, beyond the use of technology um, and even just applying very common, common logistics. So you have, for example... Uh, this initiative, Parking Day, which I think started in San Francisco, but nowadays Brussels has its uh, Parking Day in, uh, in Elsene, I believe, um, which is, yeah, like the typical grassroots movement, some guy who said, Let, let's block or let's book this parking space for one day, let's put some books there, let's put a chair there, and just provide an opportunity for people to talk and to engage in, in or to interact with each other and to fulfill a social role. Think of urban gardening, uh, where the abandoned lots are being used or becoming used to, uh, to cultivate your own vegetables, your own fruits, your own plants. Um, of course, it's a social movement uh, to also motivate some more sustainable communities. Um, and then if we look at technology, we also see some artists. Well, this is in New York. There should be a subway here, but it's not very visible, but anyway. Um, think of how people actually creatively provide an answer to the abundance of commercial content here. Um, Jason Epping simply made a very uh, straightforward uh, matrix of um, panels that he could put in front of or on top of uh, the electronic displays owned by the Metropolitan Transport Authority in New York that shows yeah, simply commercial content. And what he made was this very abstract uh, and ever-changing uh, piece of art, so to say, sort of open spectacle. Um, and also think of people covering ad space uh, in cities with uh, yeah, sort of a platform for open communication again. Uh, here, this is in Toronto, and there the discussion was not about, not just about the content that was shown, but also architecturally. These displays were really positioned literally in the middle of a sidewalk. Uh, people bumped into them all the time. Um, and instead of vandalizing them, this is, of course, a very nice initiative where people get the chance to, to say something and to communicate with each other. And in some way, also think about how urban infrastructure may be hacked from time to time, like the Parasite Project in Berlin, uh, where they attach uh, projectors to the subway carriages. And while driving in the tunnels, uh, there was a continuous, uh, very mesmerizing uh, show shown to you. Um, so given these challenges that media architecture is actually confronted with, but also given the new movements that start to emerge in cities, um, I started my research with thinking about how we could actually involve more democratic voices, as Ben Rubin said during the past Media Architecture Biennale, which is, by the way, a very interesting venue for all of you interested somehow. Um, and I thought, what is the ultimate democratic voice? Well, obviously, it's that of the citizens themselves that will be confronted or that are confronted with media architecture on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. 
Um, and in some way, I would like to try to get into their minds, uh, get an overview of what they think of media, what they, yeah, how they would like to interact or not interact with it, uh, about the design. Um, and therefore, I set out on a sort of uh, pathway to involve them in thinking about content and to involve them in thinking about design. So I want to share observations from two recent studies uh, that I conducted with people and concerning media architecture in the urban space. Um, and in the first, which is called Open Window, I actually wanted to learn from people what should be shown or what should not be shown on public displays. And while I initially aspired to do this on existing public displays, as this had already well, been established and had already been um, well, accepted or disaccepted by people, um, it still required me to go through quite some complex and lengthy administrative procedures. Uh, municipalities are quite scared about what content is going to be shown in public. Uh, in Belgium, we have elections like every week or so. So there could not be any political content on, shown on these public displays, so we had to find a sort of balance. So what I did is move to making my own public display, uh, very roughly just a computer monitor hidden in a, in a plywood box containing a camera, containing a mini computer, and allowing citizens themselves to sort of log in to the system and show their own text message on the display. Now, of course, this is a small public display. It was a bit scaled down to the size of a house. And that's also, that was also my second step, so give it to people themselves and let it, uh, or give it to them and, and ask them to install it in their front window on a street level. And uh, kind of similar to a paper poster, publish messages that were relevant to them and that would address the neighborhood. Um, I left the content or the requirements in terms of content completely open. It was up to them. Uh, could be political, could be something very personal, could be something that triggered interaction. Um, but still it would, need to address the obvious passerby and the obvious neighbor. So this is one of them um, uh, in Antwerp North, which is a bit of a well, sensitive neighborhood, uh, language issues, social issues, etc. cetera. Um, and finally, the, the woman that owned the house and that owned the display, of course, uh, as you can see, it was during Christmas. These lamps are not there nowadays. Um, but she decorated the whole screen, so there was a Santa Claus on top of the screen after two days. Uh, it was covered in, in uh, scarves or drapes, or how do you call that? So it, she really made it her own, um, in addition to making the content herself, of course. Um, this is another one in a private neighborhood um, in Antwerp East, I believe, uh, so more or less not necessarily integrated in the architecture, as you can see, uh, but still a clear part of the house and a clear part of the family. And then the last one was handed over to a private uh, coffee shop owner uh, who decided to put it in his, uh, in his front window. Uh, so the displays and the messages that were shown onto these displays, they provided uh, an additional platform for discourse. We often saw, uh, so there was a webcam installed, uh, so we often saw people meeting in front of the display, even coming from opposite sides, people not knowing each other before and starting to talk about the display in itself, of course, but also about what was shown, which could be very philosophical, which could be very uh, context-related, like, hey, guys, don't forget the, the barbecue that we're organizing next week. Uh, don't forget to put your trash out this night or tonight. Um, so, yeah, this included the people talking in front of the house, but in uh, it is well extended to people sending text messages to thank the, the homeowners for publishing uh, funny messages or very personal messages. Uh, people sending messages or even dropping notes in the mailbox to ask, like, hey, can you please publish something about topic, topic X? Um, people starting to copy messages onto virtual social networks, such as Facebook and Twitter. So people from the neighboring streets, they could also kind of uh, engage in the discussion because they did not necessarily walk in front of the house every day. Um, or people ringing the doorbell, um, so asking for a specific message to be published. This was quite rare, I have to admit, but still some people felt the urge to go and ring the doorbell. And, and ask for something to be published, um, or responding to erroneous content like this guy in front of the, of the 
coffee shop window. I think, I believe that the message at that time was uh, like, next up there will be a song playing about the Beatles. It's a small band from, from London. And then he made this very clear sign. He went inside and then 10 or 15 minutes later there was an update posted. Oh, sorry, there, it's a group from Liverpool. Or is it the other way around? You should know. Okay. <laughs> so in that sense, it triggered quite some discussion. Afterwards, of course, this guy ordered a coffee, so it was beneficial for the coffee shop owner as well. Um, but at least it provided some sort of uh, platform for social interaction. Now, through the analysis of content, and I don't want to go into too much detail, uh, but we learned that people particularly published messages that were relevant to their own environment. No uh, national news items, no international news items, no major sports events that were published, but really uh, texts that built upon their own emotions, their own feelings, their own context, their own neighborhood. Um, I'm thinking of the message, for example, that warned or that asked the potential buyer of a, a house on the other side of the street to please leave the pear tree in the garden because the pears are really appreciated by the children in the neighborhood. You can imagine that such a message is very clear and very obvious and very understandable for people living in that street, and perhaps even for parents of children. But it's very difficult to understand by people living even in the streets, in the other street, in one of the other streets. Uh, so that, to us, it indicated the, the aspect and the value of hyper-locality, so really hyper-local uh, messages on the level of a street or even on the level of a part of a street. Um, also, as deployment progressed, we learned from households themselves, but also from neighbors, there, there was actually a sort of uh, request to participate in creating content. Uh, people saw or people observed that after a while the households lost their interest in sustaining or in sustained publication of messages. Um, but also they saw the potential as in democratically sharing this platform and democratically sharing uh, a platform for voicing their own opinions and their own ideas. But at the same time, even though there was this request for participation, it also raised some um, observations in terms of ch challenges that exist on the urban level. While a message like, happy birthday, person X, uh, have a nice day, may be well, well meant, of course, you can feel, or at least we felt during our research, that people also felt the tension. What happens if you don't uh, congratulate person X with his birthday? but you do congratulate person A, for example. Now, this is just a minor detail, of course, but you can imagine that if you extend it towards political messages or religious messages or, well, any kind of messages, that on an urban level it's very um, easy to cause some sort of conflict with people that have other norms, other beliefs, other expectations, others, other desires. So in that sense, I think uh, democratically sharing and, and opening up such a platform would be, would be definitely beneficial. So at least someone has the uh, chance to say, hey, I don't agree with this message, let's change or let's moderate this message, uh, and so on. In a second, more recent study, uh, I set out to involve citizens not only in deciding about the content that is gonna be shown or published or printed or whatever, um, but also in the design and their own personal appropriation of, of media architecture. And I was particularly interested in how their feelings about, in how their um, ideas about the neighborhood could actually qualitatively contribute to a design of media architecture. Because um, indeed there is a lot of knowledge and, and experience among well, people living in a specific street about their street, and what is their position in the street, what do they think of neighbor A and neighbor B, do they communicate, what do they talk about, or what don't they talk about. And I wanted to, to reveal this, and I wanted to use these insights to inform uh, the design of media architecture. So I organized brainstorm sessions with, uh, with households, where all household members could participate, and that was really the, the, one of the key points, that, that also children could, uh, could be involved, because otherwise they're mostly left out of all these decisions, um, because it's too complex, or it's too expensive, or whatever. Um, but still, sometimes I have this very particular and peculiar idea about their, their neighborhood, and I really wanted to reveal that. 
um, in order to create uh, a conceptual idea that would in some way respond to the qualities and the concerns that I had previously voiced. Um, so as you can see, it's a sort of a sort of a game, and throughout the game, uh, people replied to specific questions about the neighborhoods, and at certain occasions, they could collaboratively develop uh, a very innovative concept of media architecture. For example, one family imagined, or one family actually expressed that they liked to talk with neighbors, slash gossip with neighbors. Uh, that was a comment of the daughter. Um, and as you all know, in Belgium, rainfall is quite omnipresent. So what they thought of was a sort of kinetic umbrella that would automatically open up when uh, people are talking in front of the house and when rainfall is detected, uh, and even an interactive light that would uh, be turned on at night so the conversations could, uh, could continue. Now, even though most of these concepts, they were rough, they were, well, financially in infeasible or technically infeasible, um, it still provided me, so the game still provided me with, well, plenty of insights uh, to develop new concepts. And I did it together with three families. Uh, so this is Riedel. It's uh, conceived as a sort of printer that simply spits out, uh, well, printed messages to neighbors at the press of a button. Um, why a printer? Because this family, they liked literature, they liked reading. Um, they were also the managers of the local weblog, of the streets weblog, and they saw something with printers in front of their house printing out messages to people in the streets, but especially uh, in an attempt to also um, send messages to the elderly people in the street who are otherwise not on Facebook or have no access to internet whatsoever. Uh, so provide them with an opportunity to, uh, to read these messages, take something home, annotate, reply, etc., etc. Um, and ultimately, so it was developed um, with some comments from them like what color pattern, uh, what should it do, how should the output look like, uh, what should the button press do, etc., etc. And finally, it was attached to their uh, house uh, facade. A second project, Listen. Um, there it was quite obvious that the family loved music. There were headphones scattered throughout the house. Uh, uh, even after deploying this design, I learned that uh, the family owned a collection of approximately 10,000 CDs in their basement. So I think it was quite obvious that they had some love for music, for sound. Uh, he liked to talk as well, by the way. Um, so it motivated me to embrace sound as a sort of output medium. Um, and then, yeah, what do you do? You would, may attach a headphone to a facade, which is otherwise not really done, I think. Um, and we attached it to the mailbox. Well, you can't really see it, but anyway, it's attached to the mailbox um, in order to even strengthen the, the private aspect. Uh, a mailbox is a very private part of your, of your house facade. Your, your private mail is getting dropped in there. And by attaching to that, we, we think that we even strengthened this, uh, this private, uh, private character. What would it allow you to do? Um, obviously, listen in to what happens inside the family. To some extent, of course, it's not a live recording. Uh, but people or the, the family members, they record audio fragments uh, through a web page. And then they get played either a happy message or an unhappy message um, for passersby for residents. And then ultimately, uh, Shush, which is a more, which is a very abstract project, um, and it's an LED strip uh, that actually responds in real time to ambient noise. In that family, during our discussions, the young daughter she mentioned that her sleeping pattern was regularly uh, interrupted because of street noise. There was this uh, homeowner next door with a very uh, big BMW car making a lot of noise, and, well, she was quite annoyed with that. Um, on top of that, the father played in a band, so he was quite used to all these uh, VU meters, etc. So with them, we worked towards, well, a very simple project that actually just visualized sound uh, in the street, and as such, kind of uh, attempt to trigger an effect with people, be it be more silent, or what actually happened in the end, be more noisy. Uh, so that was a bit of an unexpected result. Uh, <laughs> but still, well, it, it pointed us to something interesting. Um, and at the press of a button, so each of these uh, displays or devices were interactive. So at the press of a button, you would get some sort of uh, 
rewards through the light effects that were shown on the LED strip. Um, and during the study, which ran over the course of eight weeks, initially, I, in fact, I set out to deploy it for three weeks. As you saw, it were Arduinos. They're not really made for outdoor use, uh, but still, we had a very warm summer, so that worked, uh, winter, sorry, so that worked fine. Um, and also, family members themselves, that actually asked, like, hey, can we keep this thing a little longer because we want to, well, we want to keep it and we want to keep using it and keep showing it to the street. Um, and I observed the street at numerous occasions, and I was quite happy to see, um, well, all kinds of user groups using them, pressing a button, waiting, putting up a headphone, um, except for the elderly people. In fact, putting on a headphone was, for them, that was a very big step to take. Um, but I was especially happy with people like the one shown here, which is a city worker uh, in Antwerp that, that kind of have this uh, idea that city workers never work. Um, he didn't, actually. Uh, he really loved these three projects, and he, um, well, he, he couldn't speak Dutch. Uh, I don't know what language he spoke, actually. Uh, we had a very interesting conversation, I guess. Uh, but still, he, he kept listening, and he kept listening to the same audio fragments time after time, and, well, you could see him, like, trying to make sense out of it. He, he waved at his colleagues that were working nearby, so they were working, he wasn't. Uh, <laughs> I guess he had a senior position or something. Um, so he waved at them like, hey, guys, come on and listen. And, well, it, it was interesting to see these kinds of people who are otherwise very unfamiliar with the neighborhood to engage and to interact with these, uh, with these things. Um, but mostly it was very popular with children. Um, well, children, adults, teenagers. Um, they were eager to actually interact with each of these devices on their way to and from school. Um, to print a message, uh, to, to share it with each other, to reply and to, to put it back in the mailbox or deposit it in the mailbox. Um, there was one teenager who explicitly mentioned that he liked to print uh, things from, from this device, or from this, uh, from Riedel, to take home, to have something tangible and to have uh, another uh, topic to talk about during the family dinners or during breakfast. Uh, so that was interesting to see. Um, but perhaps the most striking observation already happened after, uh, after two days, where one father of a terminally, terminally ill boy in the street, uh, it's not shown on this picture, uh, he actually printed a note from Greedel, so a, a, a printed piece of paper. He wrote a very lengthy text, and he deposited it in the mailbox of the household that owned Listen, so the headphone. And on the note, he asked, uh, hey, I'm organizing this fundraiser event for my terminally ill boy uh, to uh, fund the, uh, the organization that kind of uh, stimulates research, etc." cetera. Um, and he wanted to communicate that in some way. He didn't really like to ring all the doorbells in the street uh, because he had the experience that people simply say no already if they see some unfamiliar face uh, in their front door. Um, and he wanted to do that in a very unobtrusive manner. Um, so he deposited in the mailbox. Afterwards, the family that owned Listen called him and said, hey, man, no problem, come over. Uh, they didn't know each other. Well, they, they met each other. They saw each other in the street before, but they never talked before. Uh, but still, they invited him over. Uh, he came into their house. He recorded the message. Uh, they had a lengthy discussion about, I don't know, about everything or a lot of aspects, I guess. Uh, but it was interesting to see that it could, well, could be used for such purposes and could definitely trigger uh, social interaction. Um, so in summary, to me, uh, this study revealed that media architecture actually has a potential uh, beyond the skyscraper, even though media architecture is usually all these uh, blinking LEDs, um, well, big audiovisual effects. I think there is also some... Uh, quality in also <laughs> using more traditional technologies like the printer, like audio, or like the headphone, uh, like music, etc. Um, so I think there is a potential beyond the skyscraper, beyond commercial uh, motivations or objectives, and try to deploy it in a more well residential neighborhood or at least scaled down, not necessarily with a huge urban impact. But I think a residential impact or an impact on one street or a part of a street, that can already mean a lot, especially nowadays when cities are changing, people start to communicate less with each other but more with their smartphone. 
I think it, this study has proven that there is quite some potential in, uh, in doing such work. Um, I was also, well, positively um, surprised by how many insights live among residents in a neighborhood and how these insights can actually contribute to the design of technology, of design of, of urban media, um, while also motivating some sustained engagement from the household themselves, so keep publishing messages, uh, keep recording audio fragments, uh, but also from the neighbors. They really kept pushing the button, so to say. They really kept listening. They really kept uh, taking notes. They really kept actually writing replies and depositing it in the mailbox of the households. Um, so it was really a continuous uh, interaction between, between all these stakeholders. Um, so yeah, I think there is quite some potential in situating media architecture uh, more in its own context. And that's actually also my, my takeaway from this talk, to raise awareness on the various levels of, um, of contexts that surround media architecture or in general media, uh, urban media in urban space. So first of all, look at your environment. So what is this environment composed of? What is the social structure? What is the demographic structure? How do people interact already, or how don't they interact at this point in time? Um, look at your carrier, look at the architecture, which can be a, which can be a building, which can be a square, um, which can be the canal in front of this building, so to say. Um, but look at the qualities of this architecture and look at, at how the media can contribute to the architecture. But also think about what the possible effect may be that if you remove your media, what might be the impact on the architecture? Also the other way around, what might be the impact of the architecture on the media itself? Um, and ultimately, of course, the content. What do you show on media or what do you, well, uh, what's the audio you will play or whatever? Um, what is the impact of this content on the environment? How do they perceive it? What would people themselves want to see on, uh, on media or want to uh, learn from media? Um, and yeah, I think triggering some kinds of uh, bottom-up approaches involving citizens uh, at least may have quite some positive, uh, positive effects on media, on their sustained acceptance in the urban uh, environment. Thank you. So thank you, Nils. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, hi. I have a small question to something, uh, referring to something that you said at the beginning. When you were referring to the vandalized uh, uh, vitrines and uh, yeah, displays, couldn't be considered this vandalism, or you call it vandalism, a means of expression as well, and maybe having into account uh, why people are doing this also as something to be taken into account, not only something to kind of judge in some uh, yeah, criteria, but also something that it's uh, why people are doing this and this uh, actually be, be taken yeah. as something positive and not something to avoid. We, we actually set out to involve people and to ask people why they did it. And apparently, so it was a screen in, uh, in Elsene, so around Brussels. Uh, and apparently after the acts of vandalism, they also distributed flyers throughout the neighborhood saying that we will resist any act of, uh, well, this abundance of, of advertising in our environment um, in order to, well, they, they clearly made it, uh, or they made it clear that they did not appreciate such commercial messages or such messages that did not really stroke with their social and demographic structure uh, whatsoever. Is that an, an answer to your question? But I, I think it provides us with insights that we actually should involve these people. Yeah, uh, exactly. And also make things open enough yeah. so that maybe even make things open to vandalism, you know? Yeah. Like, and how, how would that look? Yeah. Like, I, I was thinking of a, of a artwork, uh, I think it was the Dutch artist that uh, maybe in, in Almere it was called One Cubic Meter of Silence and was this, uh, uh, yeah, cube uh, of, a, of, a, of a glass window that was completely silent in, in Almere. And then it was vandalized with a, with a brick, and then it, when it was shown in the museum, it was actually the vandalized uh, 
thing, and it, and it, and it became also a kind of message that uh, took it further. So, uh, I mean, uh, this, of course, is a, it's a kind of a different case because it was not what it was maybe planned to be, and it well, changed completely the message, but, uh, <laughs> but making things open also to have this kind of vandalism or something that could uh, make an input or uh, affect positively. The yeah, I'm sure you have different kinds of vandalism, just vandalism for the vandalism, which is a different kind of thing that you can never avoid. But I think here the case was very clear. It was vandalism because of the content that was shown. And I think, like you say, that we should really provide people with mechanisms to uh, to involve them. Like, what would you like to see? How would you like to see uh, these messages? Uh, how can you contribute or how can you not contribute? And preferably, of course, we do that before we uh, put a public display there uh, or media architecture in general. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, uh, how do you see this type of uh, bottom-up media, market, uh, media architectures uh, scale um, to bigger neighborhoods, and what kind of considerations do you need to uh, think about? Uh, do you need a sort of uh, method of moderation um, for the sort of discussions that can take place? Or? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, and that's actually the step that I'm about to take in the next few months, so really scaling it up uh, to the level of a neighborhood, also a neighborhood that... Uh, has its complexities and its challenges, its issues, its concerns, um, and then evaluate together with, well, preferably the whole neighborhood, but it's practically impossible to really involve all people, but still a substantial part of the neighborhood, um, and uh, investigate together with them what could contribute to, uh, to this neighborhood, what could not necessarily provide an answer to the challenges, but at least pinpoint the facts or, uh, well, make contributions to the neighborhoods. But it's, it's one of the steps that it's, that's about to be taken, absolutely. I was wondering, with the distribution of the screens, uh, did the owners of the screen um, take on a role as moderators? Sorry, the distribution the, of them? With, uh, with the public screens behind yeah. the windows, did the owners of the screens uh, take on a role as moderator of uh, what can or cannot be? Uh, they were the only ones who were able to control the content. Yeah. Uh, so they moderated themselves in a, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and our observation afterwards was that actually there was a common desire to share this with the greater community to, to have their own messages published. So there was not really moderation involved because, well, I, I can realize or can, I can imagine that they uh, consciously publish their own messages. There's no cases of censorship? Or <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. No. Sure. Self-censorship, in a way, perhaps. Hmm? <clears throat> it's on, okay. Uh, I remember earlier on you were talking about that um, giving the platform for the people to pretty much speak up anything, then it also involves sometimes like very personal message to you know person X, but not necessarily interesting uh, for you know it's interesting for other people. So I actually had an experience a very similar um, kind of interaction. Um, I did also video interactive video projection that was pretty much about anything writing messages. So uh, after that type of uh, in a conflict that you had, um, are you like investigating more in a possible way to um, not just have people, for example, speak about anything, but more into like a kind of raising questions on specific topics through the platform itself? I would consider that to be how people appropriate the system, so asking questions or simply uh, voicing a, a certain opinion. Um, but in order to avoid being too specific or in order to avoid just mentioning one specific person, uh, by opening up the system, we or I envision some sort of uh, shared moderation between the people where, for example, you, you would submit a message, but it has to go through this chain of moderators with, which don't necessarily have to be uh, doesn't necessarily have to be the whole street, of course, but like two or three representatives that moderate your, your message in order to avoid these things. But I would definitely leave it completely open to the people, uh, whether or not they want to ask a question or simply voice, uh, voice an opinion or write something poetic or philosophical. Uh, Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the 
the first project you showed where the, the demographics of the street um, were presented below the street sign. That seems like a, a very different, less distributed way of creating meaning um, in the city. So I suppose my question is, what, what were the responses to this project in the neighborhood? So it's, it's a colleague's project, um, but um, her interviews revealed that people actually were amazed, like, oh, it's only this small amount of immigrants living here, or, oh, we, we have always exager exaggerated the cases of vandalism in this neighborhood. So it, in a way, it was very revealing to them to all of a sudden see the real precise data, because we, we all live in this idea like, uh, I don't know, uh, City X consists of that amount of immigrants or that language is never spoken there or blah, blah, blah. But then again, I think that visualizing this data and especially on the level of the streets uh, that people are extremely familiar with, um, well, it's, it's yeah, revealing uh, and just points you at the facts. Uh, there is no more room for discussion, so to say. Um, but on the other hand, of course, people were also quite um, uncertain about the the truth behind these numbers, uh, because they, they obviously saw that it was sort of a, an urban hack. It was, it was also put up at night, I think. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, but well, it never said this is part of research, or it never shows you that the University of Leuven is involved. It was mentioned on the back, if the police or the city were to turn up. Um, but it made people think about, are these data, or is this data actually true and accurate and correct? Um, so I think that, that might be something to work on with, with data in the future. Uh, but it was revealing, definitely. Anyone else? Uh, you have uh, chosen um, political, in a way, political example, like uh, this... Um, this installation and then uh, the screen who was uh, destroyed. It's, uh, there is a very strong uh, politic background. And yep. then in your, experiment in, in your experimentation at the end, uh, it's, there is nothing political in it. Is it on purpose or? Um, well, I don't really agree because I think people were able to make it political. Um, but what I learned is that by, you mean the last project with these abstract displays, right? With the printer and the headphone. Um, what I learned there is that people appreciated the fact that it was attached to a private house facade. And then people said, well, actually, I don't care whether or not this is uh, political content uh, or says something critical about the current economic status, because I know that it's the family controlling the content. Uh, and I know that the content is not controlled by some higher authority that you have, well, hardly any contact with. And I think that's the case with most public displays. There you know it's owned by the city or it's owned by some sort of government, but you don't exactly know who is the person who published that message. Mostly it's, it's someone working on the communication department, but is it politically inspired? Uh, mostly, of course, it's culturally inspired, I know. Um, but there is a, a sort of, yeah, Tension, friction between these uh, these two two projects. You're initiating a, a, de a political debate with this kind of thing, and then with the screen inside the house is absolutely not. No, there it's more about interaction between people, motivating the interaction to begin with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is there another question? Yes. No. Uh, I suppose a, a, a quick thing, it, sorry, a quick thing it made me think of, um, I was working as a youth worker in Liverpool quite a few years ago and a lot of uh, places started to install um, these sirens that only teenagers could hear um, oh. and they, they would yeah. create these, these incredibly high-pitched, um, really unpleasant sounds. But a group of teenagers we were working with uh, actually chose to congregate um, around a siren by a church uh, and they used to kind of spend the evening dancing around this, uh, <laughs> this high-pitched sound. Um, and I was thinking of the openness of your system um, and how children and teenagers that I can think of might use that and, and kind of, uh, you know, uh, 
you use it to, to uh, create content that a lot of adults might not approve of. Um, was there any tension between how the young people were using it and how adults wanted them to use it? No, hardly any, uh, actually. Uh, like you say, it was a very open system. Everyone considered it in his own way. Uh, I guess children just wanted to press the button. <laughs> we all want to press the button, right? Uh, while adults, they really had this idea, okay, I want to know what, uh, what this household had uh, wanted to, to share with us today, or I want to have some message to take home. But children simply wanted to, to press the button. The only tension might be that uh, mothers picking up their children from school, they wanted to go home quite quickly. But the children were really pushing or pulling her arm, like, hey, I want to print another message, and I want to take, uh, take home half of the paper roll. Uh, I think that was the only tension, but there was no no more no, well no social tension or uh, conflict or whatsoever. Is there a last question? Maybe yes, no. So maybe we do a small three-minute break so we can change uh, the speaker and then yeah, go ahead. <laughs>